My education was not going to school. I've never been to school ever. I, I don't even have grade one. Uh, but we had an 1840s engineering encyclopedia. And so to learn to read and write, I did all the words, underlined the ones I couldn't understand, which was pretty much all of them in the beginning, and uh, learned to read and uh, write and to understand through memorizing three volumes of the engineering encyclopedia. You wouldn't believe the archaic, ancient engineering principles stuck away in this head. Which, by the way, I'm finding out now that they're bringing them to the forefront again and hailing them as new ideas. Uh, I always wanted to be an engineer and couldn't be. Uh, they wouldn't even talk to me. They, they uh, said that I would have to go through all this schooling, all of goodness gracious. And I've always had this ability of being able to earn money. I organized the natives. I created... Uh, uh, a cooperative fur trading group. It was the first one of its kind ever. I wound up taking the furs myself to the auction sale where Hudson's Bay was selling their furs and instead of 12 cents a fur, I was getting a uh, $1.85, that sort of thing. And uh, as an 18 year old, in my third month, um, I earned my first $30,000. It was quite by accident, but I've been at it ever since. And so, when I wanted to be an engineer and couldn't be, I just went out and bought my own engineering firm. And uh, <clears throat> it came with an engineer. And so, uh, I put a suit on, and uh, who's to say I'm not an engineer, right? And so, I wound up, would you believe, building government buildings. But during the end of that contract, we uh, had a chopper to install because they wanted to make pipe a specific length. And uh, what I did is I literally built a device that had a series of rollers on it that would roll the, the sheet metal around like this, and I put a long, long arm inside of it with a shaver on it and built an automatic welder on top so that as the sheet, when it came together, was welded continuously any size with rollers on the inside in the beginning and the outside all the way along to the end, the pipe would have a seamless, literally a seamless weld all the way down the top of it. And it would be shaved on the inside so that it would withstand the 1700 PSI pressures that were, were expected of it. <clears throat> the contract went very well. I was paid. And in the last of it, we were installing the chopper and a young 17-year-old boy who was an apprentice welder uh, we were making lead pipe or, or lead uh, hammers because we had to move a huge shaft with threads all over it. And when you hit the, the, the sh threads with a hammer, you damage the threads. So you make these big lead hammers and the lead bends and you move the shaft. And this youngster was wondering what would happen if he threw a cup of coffee into this 50 pound pot of molten lead. And when he threw the coffee in, the explosion that occurred picked me up and embedded me in a wall. And that was that. And uh, oh, every time I talk about this, I get this horrendous rush. I'm going to have to quit talking about this. At any rate, um, everything sort of uh, just came in to a dot in the center, and then it went out. And when it went out, uh, I heard this horrendous racket. All of a sudden, that dot appeared again. And some, something walked in front of the dot, passed by it. And I thought, oh, well, whatever, wherever I am, I'm going to find out. And the dot started to open up. And here, there was some firemen cutting me out of the wall with a chainsaw. <laughs> that was the noise. Well, I was relieved. And uh, it hurt. I was badly burned. I had no hair. I never grew hair for a couple of years. I was bald. Um, I was badly burnt all over my body. I have terminal lead poisoning, which the lead went into my tissue and cooled down there and formed millions of tiny little balls of, of pure lead in my tissue. Uh, my liver started to fail. I was told by, uh, by the folks at the hospital that I uh, was not going to survive this. That was the very first time that I ever found out that love and forgiveness were very important in life if you want to survive. 
For you see, a young man had stolen $4,000 from me. And I was so furious at him because he was, I trusted him and he hurt me. I really trusted this person. I, I, I gave this person a lot of leeway in my business. And he stole $4,000 from me. Thank heavens I caught him when I did. He'd have bankrupted me in the end. But anyway, I caught him. And I was so mad at him, I just said, go away, don't bother me, I'm not going to call the police, I don't want to get involved in that, just leave me alone. Well, when I'm in the hospital, he comes into the room, and uh, it was then that I realized how bad off I was, because he didn't recognize me. And that really did something to me then, too. Uh, Up until that time, I never really thought I was really that bad off. And he came in, he looked at me, and he said, wow. He said, listen, he said, I really heard you were in a bad way. I came to apologize to you. But he said, there's something about me that you didn't know, and I really should have told you. He said, I was kind of involved in drugs and things. And, uh, and he said, I shouldn't have been, and, uh, but I was. And he said, I'm really sorry. But he said, look, he said, you know, he said, you, you, you have all this money and stuff, and I'll never make anything out of myself, and you're not going to be here, and... I was sort of wondering if you could sort of see yourself clear to uh, (laughs) sort of donate a little of that money to me. (laughs) You know, I gave serious consideration to it. When you're in that position, and the whole world changes. It just changes. You don't really, you don't, you just don't care much. I was having trouble with the psychiatrist in the club called To Die With Dignity. Uh... She was an idiot, I'm sorry, but she just, you know, hello, now death is just an extension of life, isn't it? Yeah, you die, I'll live, lady, you know, (laughs) get on with it, let's hear something positive, and everybody's sitting there. Oh, and uh, I told her, I said, listen, even in death, even, even when you're terminal, you can be upbeat, you don't have to listen to this. And uh, so here I am, and this fellow's asking for this money, and I looked at him and I said, look, here's my decision. Where I'm going, you'll probably end up, and then I'll have to deal with you because you did, and I'll give you the money to do it. You know? You understand what I mean. And he looked at me and said, yeah, he said, I kind of thought you'd say something like that. Hey, he said, you know what? He said, "Uh, I know this guy that handles lead poisoning. (laughs) I said, really? Yeah. Now, I'm in a hospital, right? Doctors are looking after me. They're giving me the best of everything. He said, yeah. I said, oh, where is he? He said, he's in California. And he specializes in handling lead poisoning. Well, have you got the guy's name? And he said, yeah, yeah, he got his phone number. You can phone him. But he said, don't, don't, don't mention my name. I said, well, how much you rip that th- place off for? You know, I mean, the, the confession will never be the same down there, I suppose, right? He says, no, no, man. He says, just, just take it easy. Here's the number. There was a kerfuffle over the number. And this little voice, this tiny little voice answers the phone. I tell him who I am, that I've heard of him, that he can handle some lead poisoning problems. And I tell him my story. And he broke down on the phone and wept. He actually broke down on the phone and wept. And I, that was a little more than I can handle, too. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll uh, I, uh, what do you say? So I said, well, can you or can't you? He said, where are you? I told him. He said, I'll have something there for you tomorrow. I said, okay. So the next day, in walks this airline pilot. The very next day with a box. Wow. I said, that was fast. Oh, Yes. I looked at him and said, well, who are you? He says, oh, it's all right. I'm just a friend. Here's the box. I said, great. And I opened the box. And I look at it, and there's a note in there. And the stuff in this box stinks like the bad end of a pig pen. This is bad stuff. I mean, this isn't bad stuff. This is bad stuff. And I'm... So I open the note, and I look at it, and it says, Dear Wayne, don't eat any of this till you've called me. (laughs) And I thought, oh, no. And I said, yeah, no kidding. So I called him. I said, and he's on the phone, and in this tiny little voice, I said, Ray, what is this stuff? 
Wayne, I want to tell you, God sends miracles in the strangest little packages. <laughs> and if you turn it down, that's your decision. So here's what you need to do. I'm supposed to stick this in my cheeks if I can't swallow it because I would, you know, wouldn't be able to hold that down. He was right. I couldn't hold it down. And I had to make a paste and put it all over my burns and everything. And I'm in a hospital. And I told the guy beside me, I said, hey, listen, I said, I got to do this. I got to try something. They haven't got a thing for ear for me. I said, do you think they'll handle this? Oh, to hell with them. I'm 270 pounds. They're going to have a hell of a time stopping me here. I said, I'm big and I'll buy the bed. I'll buy the sheets. I'll buy everything here. I got the money to do this. So I get up, I rummage around, and all I can find is this nice shiny round thing, you know, you sit on for a pot to mix this stuff in. And I, I clean it all up as best I can. And I'm mixing this slop in there. And it's all green and ucky and stinks to high heaven. And I'm on the bed and I said to this and my neighbor, I said, will you help me put this on my back? I can't get back there. He said, oh God. He said, I can't do that. He says, they'll kick my butt out, let alone yours. I said, well, just wash your hands. We won't tell anybody. He said, well, if we make it fast, he said, I'll help. But he said, man, he said that stuff sure in the right pot, isn't it? <laughs> Well, the nurse walks in. <laughs> and I'm, I'm relieved. This stuff is working. It took all the pain away. And I got a big chunk of it in my mouth, and I can hardly handle that. And it's all coming down my cheeks and stuff. I'm drooling. It makes the saliva run and stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, God, how long am I going to have to do this? You know, 10 minutes? No, 16 weeks. And I thought, oh, I'm never going to make this. And I'm looking at her. She walks by. Hello, Wayne. Hello. She walked back out and I thought, wow, that was easy. Look, she didn't even recognize that I had anything on me. These people are truly intelligent. God, they got it together. And then this whole mob scene in the place. They brought guards up and everything. I had to, oh, it, was, it was a bad scene. See, they thought something had gotten by the blood barrier in the brain. <laughs> hey, well, maybe it had. I'd smartened up. I realized they couldn't help me. And finally, I had to get out of the hospital. I ended up having to buy that bed and all the other stuff. It had seeped into everything. It'd be, it was kind of bad. It got in the motor, and the motor quit and was smoking this algae stuff. I mean, it was really bad. The whole thing was just a mess. And so we moved out into my place, and then I wouldn't let the police in. So they were threatening to kick the door down to get the public nurse in. And in 15 days, I was better. I was dressed. I quit bleeding. I quit, quit seeping all this liquid out of my body. But the scars and the burns, they never healed. To this day, they have never healed. You wouldn't believe what I look like underneath this suit. You just wouldn't believe it. And the lead poisoning pops out all over the place in strange places like here on my hand. It just started two days ago. And I'm going to have a tough time handling that one because I can tell by the way it's happening. So it looks like I need some more Russian chelation and I need to go through this stuff which damn near kills me every time I do it. But the point is I developed stomach and esophagus cancer out of this lead poisoning. I was in a wheelchair with arthritis out of this lead poisoning. I've fought for my life 18 solid years. And that's the start of this story that I have to tell you. I have discovered some incredibly remarkable things about life. Just about health, about the way that you can carry on past that wall that you get to all the time. If doctors couldn't handle anything, and here this little priest had come out of the woodwork and handled my lead poisoning like he did and some other health issues, and I went back to the doctors to tell them there was no interest. They weren't interested. That floored me. So I said to them, what else are you not telling us? And that meant I had to go back into history and find out where they'd made a mess of it. Mess of it. And as the further I got back in history through the 1800s, I began to realize that, look,
You know, you compare a hospital today with all their fancy white uniforms and all their multi-millions of dollars of equipment, and what did they know back then? What were they doing? Guessing? I mean, what did a doctor know then? What, what was going on? Did they know absolutely nothing? I mean, that's the opinion that everyone basically has. You know, back there in the 1800s, they knew nothing. So I started finding books, books that were published by doctors through the 1800s, books that they read and books that they learned from. And lo and behold, out of every single book were deworming programs, parasite programs, all through America, all through Canada, all through the world, parasite programs, and pictures of parasites that they had that they had found in flesh for doctors in those days did autopsies and they found parasites and I looked at that and I got a hold of doctors and they said no we don't have parasites today <laughs> no parasites in America it's just third world country problem and people with pendulums I went to them and I said do people have parasites and they did pendulum work no I said okay well, folks, I want to tell you, every single person that's used a pendulum and it said a person is parasite-free, I've done a parasite program on them. People that do muscle testing. Look, a parasite program is a poison. Are you going to test good for a poison? No, never. So muscle testing's out too. If you're going to muscle test for a poison, an awful lot of you are going to do a disservice to yourself because you're going to muscle test that you don't need this stuff in your body. Believe me, you don't, but you do. So we started to search for parasite programs just to see what was going on, to see if maybe something was happening that we really didn't understand. So I did myself first. And lo and behold, I got eight and ten inch critters out of me. They were white, First of all, they were in a toilet water and they were all bunched up. That looked, I thought it was mucus. Until, just for a curiosity, I threw some hot water in the toilet to warm it up and then went and gosh, they were, they strung out and they were swimming all over. And I thought, oh my heavens, look at that. Since then, I've done 100,000 of you. In five years, I've dewormed 100,000 of you. 100,000 of you. And you should see and hear the stories. We're now doing pictures in color out of clinics where you go potty on a special pot with a screen in it and they take pictures of the parasites they get out of you on these different deworming programs. You're just not going to believe what I've got to show you next round. You're just not going to believe this. Uh, the last pictures are coming in when I get home. They should be there. The woman got 18 inch long critters out of her that were so thick she couldn't get them into a top of a juice bottle. She got eight of them. Eight of them. They're usually translucent. They're usually white. And uh, there's some of them that look like tarantula spiders. Some of them look like grasshoppers. Some of them look like uh, little tiny miniature sailboats. Some of them look like little spacecraft. There, this is really strange stuff. And every single person I have dewormed, I have never yet dewormed anyone where they didn't tell me, hey, I feel 25% better. They have bad breath. Halitosis is a, is a main cause. By the time you got halitosis, you're, you're loaded because that's worm urine and worm droppings that you're breathing out. So it's no wonder your breath's bad. Um, <laughs> the uh, critters, when they pee, that's called ammonia. So just go to a doctor, have a blood test, and see what level of ammonia is in your blood. If you have ammonia in your blood, that's called worm urine. That's what it is. So we have a test to see if you've got a lot of worms. If you're on a fast and you're fasting and you're, you're, you're on a diet and you get a headache, you got the headache because the worms are all peeing trying to get you to eat something else. They're trying to make you sick so you'll get off of what you're doing and start eating. So you take some arginine and orthanine in a matter of 20 minutes, if the headache's gone, you've neutralized the worm urine and you know that you're loaded. All children that have little tiny pimples on the backs of their arms or little tiny pimples here on the edges of their cheeks have five varieties of critters in them.
five varieties. It's time to deworm and it's time to get them out. Now what I found out was is that vibration and frequency is everything. It is literally everything. If you take an aspirin, it changes the way you vibrate. And so it blocks the nerves so that you can't feel pain. If you take deworming programs, you change your vibration and you change your vibration so dramatically that the worms and parasites either have to get out of you, this is no longer a good home, or they die in you. And then your lungs and your liver and all that stuff handle it. And you do it with water. And out of all of this, I handled my cancer, my stomach and esophagus cancer, which is a terminal problem. I am the only that I know survivor of stomach and esophagus cancer in this nation. I'm the only one that I know. All right? I did it with frequency. A man by the name of Royal Rife in 1934 had a microscope and invented a particular device. I found one of his original devices. I used it and it got rid of my cancer and I haven't had it since. Now that was in 1934. So you can see what they've held from you. So what we did is we looked at Nikola Tesla. We looked at all his equipment. We did all his stuff and I went out searching out original pieces of his equipment. I own more pieces of original Tesla equipment than any other human that I know. And so using lightning, lightning, a million two hundred thousand volts of kinetic energy, we fire that down a tube onto an absolute pure piece of silver. It's 99.99999 parts pure, it's as expensive as platinum. The lightning boils the molecules on the surface and we spray clean drinking water as rain onto the surface and the molecules explode into solution in angstrom size and we can control the lightning and what happens is it controls the field of flux around the mo tiny molecules of silver and so therefore the silver starts to broadcast that into solution and voila, we have a rife machine in water. And I found out that all the planets that revolve around the sun are making noise. They're singing to each other. They're making noise. And then I found out that miraculously, when a piano was invented, they didn't even know about some of the planets. But when they tuned that piano, they matched all the hertz rates and all the notes to all the planets, and they got them all right. And they didn't have to tune a piano that way. Crazy Otto out of Germany played beautiful music and he used an untuned grand piano to play his music. So they didn't have to tune the piano that way they did. That to me was a miracle. Now, when you eat food, you take on parasite eggs. You just do. They're in all vegetables. All of them. Through the process of osmosis, when all those parasite eggs are in the soil and you water the garden, the eggs get into the, into the plant through the process of osmosis and you consume them when you eat a salad. The reason they hatch is because when they make salad dressing, they use propa alcohol, food grade propa alcohol. They wash the huge tank out today and tomorrow they make honey mustard and they don't clean the propa alcohol out of the tank properly. And so they mix the new salad dressing with propa alcohol. That breaks down the shell of the egg and what gets in your gut, it hatches. Now it gets into your bloodstream because it's a really, really small little organism and it's got a problem. There are these things called T cells going to devour them. And this one little bug had a friend, Pete, and he's already in that T-cell screaming for his life. I mean, I can imagine the, the terror. And for some reason, your, as an example, your pancreas houses wood alcohol. When it houses wood alcohol to save you from it, that little parasite can feel the vibration and goes there for safety to see if it is safe, and lo and behold, it is. T-cells can't go close to wood alcohol. And so it gets in there and it starts to grow up and all kinds of others get in there and they have a great time and they drop their feces in there. The feces attracts another virus that lives in it and mold which grows a little. And up to this point I've only had two failures in five years. Two failures in five years and I'm still working with both of them. 
And I tell you, it's a deworming program. When they get into your thymus, do you know what happens? Your thymus starts to shut down. It, it, it disturbs the quantity and quality of acid in your stomach. And as a result of that, you come down with Epstein-Barr chronic fatigue syndrome or can, candida. The mold now grows in your stomach because the acid isn't strong enough to kill it. And so the fruits you eat, here you've got a new pro problem. You're developing warts and all kinds of other things, and it's a mold problem. When you've got flukes in your thymus, you develop chronic fatigue and Epstein-Barr. I do not make money on it. I do not sell it. It's a freedom of speech issue. All I sell are the support things around it. There are all kinds of things I've discovered that go with this. There's uh, eye drops for those people that can't read and need glasses. If you get yourself uh, a small amount of Clarivastan, which is an eye drop, and I think they've got some over there, you wind up rebuilding your eyeballs. I went to a man who needed deworming badly because he had bad breath, and he is an eye specialist, and he just laughed at me until he was doing an exam in the state that I live in on a woman, and a worm swam through. <clears throat> These parasites are, do not stay in one spot. They travel all over. They're small, they're microscopic, and you know what? Just in the tapeworm variety, there are 700 varieties. Just in that one grouping. If you're loaded with parasites, you're going to go bald because certain parasites get into your scalp and there they shut down the, the hair follicles with their feces. And folks, when I dewormed, that's how I grew this hair back. You know how many men have grown their hair back because they dewormed and now they're doing their stuff? You'd just be amazed. The hair just starts to grow back. I'm telling you folks, this is big stuff. And now the FDA is on to us. They now know what the water will do. They now know what all this stuff is do. So they're prescriptionalizing everything. You will not be able to buy, you will not be able to hear me probably after February the 13th or so, or March the 15th this year. Nobody will be able to stand up here and talk like I'm talking right now because the FDA is shutting it all down with a new program they put in motion that is a labeling issue and they're taking all colloids off the market. So we're dropping it into drinking water standards. That means I can sell drinking water. You'll still be able to buy the product, but I will never again be able to stand up and talk about it. Communism is here. We have not done anything about it. And if you want to do something about it, you better start doing something now because this is a major issue. This means you cannot go to the health food store and read a damn thing about what you're buying. Nothing. You can't read about it. You can't walk in and buy colloidal silver in a store that's, that does wonders for you. And the way they put it down, some 75-year-old woman, when she was 13 years old, said she drank some colloidal silver and turned blue. No one in the history of anything has ever turned blue from it. A few of them, when they were drinking uh, uh, a poison, which wasn't colloidal silver, it was uh, silver nitrate, they turned gray. But the point is, is they're not, the, the FDA doesn't care. They've got you where they want you. You're not doing anything, and so they're shutting everything down. I've done the absolute best I can, folks, and I tell you right